So we're here today with Leanne Usher, who's a professor of economics at Queens College CUNY in New York, um, and Soren Solomon, um, who's a professor of physics at the Raqqa Institute of Physics at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, and we're going to talk to them about their new project, which has just been uh, one of the awarded uh, inaugural INED awards, uh, and it's called the Large Scale Network of Trade Credit. Um, it's an attempt to uh, model, to simulate, to understand the interaction between financial markets and, uh, and, and business credit, um, but interestingly, using actual data. Okay, this is a really fascinating development, um, that it's not just computer simulation, but it's linking up to actual, actual data. Um, who wants to start and explain this to me? Maybe Leanne. Well, we have some data that's been collected by a bank in Tessa San Paolo. And um, our colleague, Marco Lemieri, works at that bank. And they put a project together where they wanted to look at the trade links between firms. So when a supplier supplies goods downstream, that, that um, purchaser can postpone the payment. So you can postpone it usually between 30 days, 180 days. Mm -hmm. That is an actual loan. So those loans go all the way down the supply chain. And so we have um, a database that basically encompasses 20% of the entire industrial network of Italy, which is very large. So it's a very good database to work with to study the propagation across a network. You've been working in this particular strategy to develop an understanding of the macroeconomy that builds from the ground up this agent-based approach, or really I think of it maybe as accounting-based approach. Tell me a little bit about this stock flow uh, consistent accounting, because this also is not in all of the agent-based uh, right. uh, modeling at all. It gets some discipline right. to, the, to the modeling. If you, if you take a few steps back, what I've been specializing in lately after my thesis is zero intelligent agents. So it's the environment and the institutions and their accounting sheets that determine their behavior. There is some maximization going on, but they're not being adaptive. They're not interacting to other firms. They're just very locked in place. And it's just because of the financial flows that go through that balance sheet that propagate across partners because we have here counterparties. Now, Leanne, you mentioned that this was in your dissertation. So I take it you're, you're relatively recently uh, PhD. In 2005, I got my PhD. Well, congratulations. And Thank so, and, and already getting, getting uh, internationally competitive awards in, in, in the grant world. Quite amazing, I think, yeah. Um, and here's your co-author, who's a professor of physics. Um, how did you get involved in this, in this project or in this way of, of thinking about the macroeconomy? We uh, realized at some stage uh, that uh, many of the uh, 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 phenomena which happen uh, to many particle uh, um, uh, systems in physics, uh, they are uh, much more general. And in fact, this connects very much to what uh, Leanne said. Uh, she said uh, her model was zero intelligent uh, agents. They are almost molecules in this case. Uh, the, uh, uh, so, so uh, in a sense, we, we are uh, we are uh, joining in in the middle because uh, Leanne realized that certain economic uh, phenomena can be explained without having to to, to uh, enter into psychology, which is, as a science, not prepared yet to 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 contribute to the kind of very complex system. And this is what happens in physics uh, uh, in certain systems. They are what we call phase transitions, mm -hmm. uh, like boiling. You put some um, uh, water molecules in in a place. And uh, and uh, and uh, you uh, you increase the uh, the temperature and nothing happens uh, and out of a sudden, bang! There is this boiling thing and the, and I, I promise you the boiling has nothing to do with the individual behavior of a molecule of water. Nothing happens to a molecule of water at uh, at uh, 100 degrees, but with the collective yes. So so if you are able to isolate this kind of phenomena, which are so dramatic that after that, if you put on top of this the behavior of this and the fact that this guy, uh, his uh, uh, grandmother is ill and the things like that, you know, irrelevant things, they will not change the fact that it's going to be a very dramatic 
phase transition between two regimes. So Soren, when you, when you say dramatic phase transition, I think financial crisis. Yes, Am I exactly. right? Absolutely. So this is really a project to try to understand the interact, to understand how financial crises happen. Is that right? Exactly. It, I, I think you can say both ways because trade credit is one of those elastic things in the system. And so it could go either way. It could be such that when there's a financial stress, firms rely more on trade credit and it gives them a buffer. Mm -hmm. But still, so it's it could help you. It could help. Yes. So it could actually, you know, for example, this, the situation now with trade credit is that it's all um, bilateral. But if you put that on an exchange, if you centralize it, like we did the subprime mortgage, you know, asset-backed mortgages, now you have a centralized hub and you actually make it more fragile, the system, rather than off a hub and dispersed in a network, it's more elastic. So this is a hypothesis of yours. This is a hypothesis. Where this project is going, it sounds to me, is, is really testing this hypothesis that the shift from a bank-centered credit system to a market-centered credit system has changed the system dynamics in some fundamental way. That's a, that would be an, ex I Parts think that's an extension. Like, okay. that's somewhere we could go with it. At, at the moment, we just have, um, in, in Italy, we just, their, their system is very much about um, bilateral trades, and a lot of it is discounted by the bank. So it's it's sort of centralized in that sense. It primarily means that the bank has all the information. Mm -hmm. That's where we got the information from. That could be uh, extremely important because you see, suppose that you have uh, uh, three firms. A pays, uh, has to make a payment to B, B has to make payments to C, and C has to make payments to A. And none of them has the money. But the, if the bank, bank knows that actually there is uh, a th circle, th there is a circle, then yeah. uh, then it it can in a, in a fraction of a six, uh, 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 of a second to solve it. Yeah. Or on the other hand, there is this uh, reflection between something which could be very good and very self-enforcing, and uh, something could be very bad, in which the bank sees that a has uh, assets uh, uh, with B, and therefore it's solid. And B has with C, therefore it's solid, but C has with A, and therefore the three of them are worth nothing. I see. So, so, the so, other way. so yeah. this kind of network analysis, rather than linear analysis of the position of uh, instability of a certain institution, it's the core of what we can give in addition to what has been done before. Yeah, ultimately it's looking at the structure of the network and to see which structure is more stable and which structure is yeah. less stable in a trade credit network. Now I'm watching you interact here, and I'm fascinated fascinated by, it's clear that this is a genuine collaboration, okay, between people who are really very different from each other, yes. um, and you wouldn't expect them to be collaborating, or at least as a, usually it's much so tell more me, intense. what is it like? <laughs> what is it like to be, working, to be working together, and how did you find each other? Well, a lot of times there is a real great tension because, <laughs> for instance, when Leanne tells me about all these uh, hundred items on the on each on side the of the sheet. balance sheet, I get dizzy and and I uh, and 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 I and, uh, and disarmed, and uh, sometimes it takes weeks and weeks until I can, you know, really make the effort and and and. Uh, snap it into some kind of a mental structure which already I can recognize as a, as a physicist uh, as something which, which can have well-defined dynamical implications. And, and we did it very recently, this. So, so there is a, a lot of tension and there is a release of tension. It's, a, it's a, a very exciting. So it's exciting for you to be working with younger economists. Uh, and doing economic thinking after all this I, thinking I, I about hope it's particles. A reci yes. a reci but on Leanne's side, you're you're just starting out your career here. Uh, I was very fortunate in yeah. that I met Saren in France, in Lalande. We spoke, we talked, and it was possible that I could go as a visiting a researcher to the Institute for Scientific Interchange in Torino, which Saren was chair of a department. The com yeah. was essentially, it was the complexity. Yes. Yeah, so. Complexity center. And so I spent six months there. All of his students were PhD physics students. So I was the only you economist. You were the fish out of water. Yes. Yeah. Marco was there uh, on and off, but not, in, not full time this in the Marco lab. This is Lemieri, Marco Lemieri, the source of your data. Exactly. Yes. He's also an economist. Oh, okay. So, so he and I can talk the accounting language together. Um, 
And so I spent a very interesting time there. It was amazing because Soren had always gathered together the most dispersed group of people in, who were studying complexity from biology and mathematics and physics and, and economics and gathered them all there at this institute and there would be these wonderful um, seminars on complexity. And I just found it fascinating, it was fantastic. And it was great to be there as an economist as well because I could see that there was areas that I could contribute to. And Sir and I were talking the same language because I come from a heterodox background in economics. My um, supervisor was Duncan Foley, I'm from the New School. And so we had, we already have some criticisms of mainstream economics and Sir and I think found that um, interesting, right? Compared to some other economists who might have been more critical. In, in physics, we are much more critical about the, the, uh, uh, the um, establishment. The, mm. This is a game. Yeah, I always joke that uh, uh, um, a paper in economics starts something like, uh, well, in this paper we are actually building on the on the other papers, and uh, there is a very little thing which we are uh, basically verifying that they were right. And the physics uh, 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 paper starts, this kind of things was never done before, and whatever was done was completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, there is this uh, in physics there is this search yeah. for for uh, for uh, uh, what. Uh, what, what is not all right? A theory cannot be proven to be right. It only can be proven to be wrong. It can be proven to withstand certain tests. So a theory which, uh, which uh, withstands a lot of tests is a, it's a good theory, but it's never for sure true. And, and the real challenge is to find, to, to challenge it more and more. And, and yeah. sometimes so you... I'm so that opens you up to saying, well, let's have, let's have more theories. Let's have yes. more theories. Let's have different ways of thinking. It's an, it's, an opening. it's an opening. And I can see that your heterodox background and your physics culture have really made this for a wonderful yes. collaboration here. Yes. I think it sounds like a, just a really fascinating project and really thinking outside the box. And, and we're really looking forward to seeing the results of, of that and, and hearing more from you. And, and welcome to our community of INET economists. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.